Hello and welcome to the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Our leading solicitors share their views on latest legal issues and developments, and how the law might affect you, because we care about righting wrongs and providing first-class personal legal services. So please enjoy this, the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the London Legal Podcast. My name is Nicola Waldman and I'm head of the Wills and Probate team here at Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors and a member of STEP, the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. If you've listened to our previous episodes, you'll know that we look at a wide range of legal issues, focusing predominantly on those that many Londoners will face at some point during their lives. Following on from the last episode, Today, we'll be looking at buying and selling property from a wills, trusts, tax and probate angle. I'm joined here today by colleague Josephine. Josephine, do you want to introduce yourself to our listeners? Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the London Legal Podcast. My name is Josephine Russon, and I'm an associate solicitor in the wills and probate team at Hodge, Jones and Allen and an affiliate member of STEP. I joined the team here in Camden at the beginning of 2020 and specialise in advising clients on all aspects of wills, trusts, tax and future planning such as powers of attorney. We're really glad to have you on board Josephine. Now before we get started I'd like to say to our listeners that if you're new to the London Legal Podcast we'd recommend that you listen from the very first episode when our colleagues Chun and Claire from our dispute resolution team first discussed the state of the London property market and set out some key things to consider when purchasing a property with someone else. Today, we'll be exploring the implications from a wills and tax planning perspective. So to start off, let's remind our listeners about the two different ways in which joint properties can be owned. Okay, to bring the scenario to life, let's use a fairly common example where a client is looking to purchase a property with a sibling. Let's say we have a client who is looking to buy a home with her brother. They have heard that there are two different ways of owning joint property, but aren't sure what's best for them. How would you explain the different ways to them and what are the implications further on down the line? Well, they could own the property as beneficial joint tenants or tenants in common. Although we refer to tenants, they're not tenants in the rental sense. Both are ways of owning property jointly, but as joint tenants... On the death of one of them, it will pass to the other by survivorship, regardless of the terms of their will or intestacy. Couples often own property in that way. If they own as tenants in common, it means that on the death of one, their share of the property will pass under the terms of their will or intestacy, so not necessarily to the other owner. Friends would often own property in this way, as if they died, they may well want their share of the property to pass to their own family. In this case, unless our client wants her brother to inherit if she dies, it may be better to own it as tenants in common. She can still leave it to him in her will if she wants him to inherit it, but it gives her the option to change her will at a later date if her circumstances change and she has a partner or decides to get married. Thanks, Nikki. Let's say that our client is putting more money into the property than her brother. How could that be reflected in the way that they own the property? If our client is putting in more money, then this can be reflected in a separate document called a declaration of trust. They can record here the shares in which they own the property, for example, 60-40. And if that is the case, then they will definitely need to own it as tenants in common, as discussed before. The declaration of trust is a useful document to record other issues relating to their co-ownership. Examples might be what happens if one of them wants to move out, or wants to sell, or wants someone else to move in, or if work needs to be done, how will this be paid for, and anything else that they want to put into the deed. We always hope that these sort of things can be agreed amicably, but it's much easier if it can all be set out in a legal document from the start. If you don't already have a will, do you think that buying a property is an ideal time to make or change one? Definitely. For many people, buying their first home is the first time they own a significant asset and think about what they want to happen to it when they die. In our client's case, it may be that she's happy for her brother to inherit it, but it may be that they have other siblings and would want them to inherit a share and she can provide for this in her will. Other important times to consider your will is if you marry or enter into a civil partnership, if you have a child, if you separate or divorce or inherit or want to make provision for pets, if you want to make provision for a funeral 
or if you want to make provision for elderly parents or dependents that may have a disability. What sort of provisions can you make in a will to cover any property? You might want to leave a property outright, i.e. as a specific gift, or perhaps as a more limited interest, possibly in a trust, so that the beneficiary has a right to live there during their lifetime, but on death your share would pass to someone else. Or you might want to give someone a right to live there for a more limited period of time, perhaps a year or so, so that they have time to find somewhere else to live, rather than have to leave immediately. There are also tax implications to consider, with the main one being inheritance tax that may be payable on your death. You need to consider whether the person inheriting the property, or your share of it, should have to pay any tax that may be due, or whether it should be paid from another part of your estate. All of this can be drafted in the will. What would happen to a property if somebody dies without having a will in place? It's worth pointing out that around 50% of adults in the UK don't have a valid will. Statistics from Prudential suggest that this figure is even higher for Londoners, with a 2016 survey showing that 59% of adults in Greater London don't have a will. If you don't have a will, the intestacy provisions will apply. Essentially, these provide that your assets pass to your closest surviving relatives according to a particular order and with specified amounts, depending on who's inheriting. The result is often not what people expect or even want. Essentially, if you die leaving a spouse or civil partner and no children, then they will inherit everything. If you die leaving a spouse or civil partner and children, the spouse or civil partner will inherit any property you own as joint tenants, all of your personal possessions, for example, the contents of your home, the first £270,000 and half the balance. The other half goes to the children when they're 18. If there's no spouse or civil partner, the children inherit everything at 18. If there's no spouse or civil partner or children, it will go to your parents equally or the survivor. And if none, then siblings and then remoter family. So partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, friends, charities, etc. can't inherit under these rules. So even if you've lived with a partner for years and in fact own your property together as tenants in common, they could find that they end up owning the property with a member of your family. So it's better to have a will in place to avoid any uncertainty about who will inherit from you when you die and not leave it to chance. Absolutely. A common question that clients ask is whether they will need to change their will further along down the line when they sell their property and buy another. Will they always have to update it? Not necessarily, but it depends on how the will's worded. For example, if your will has a specific gift in that says, I leave number 10 the avenue or any property I own at my death as my main residence to Mary, that would cover a change of property and there might be no need to change the will. But if the will just refers to that specific property and you no longer own it when you die, then the gift will fail and that beneficiary could lose out. So in that case, you would need to change your will. There might be other reasons to review your will, for example, if you changed your mind about who would inherit. It's worth checking with a professional as it could save you money in the long run and would ensure that your wishes are adhered to and causing less stress for your loved ones at an already difficult time. Absolutely. A lot of clients are understandably concerned about the tax implications of their property. If, in our example, our client and her brother were to sell the house they bought together, would they have to pay any tax on it? If it was their home and they didn't have another home, there shouldn't be any capital gains tax to pay. But as indicated, if one of them has another home and they're not actually using that property as their home, there may be some CGT to pay if it's being sold at a gain compared to what they paid for it. If they buy another property, then stamp duty land tax may also have to be paid, calculated as a percentage of the property value. But until 31st of March 2021, there is no SDLT on property purchases valued at less than £500,000. Thanks, Nikki. Of course, as wills and probate solicitors, we always have to consider inheritance tax. When someone does pass away, will their loved ones have to pay any tax? And if so, who will pay it? That depends on the value of their net estate, i.e. the value of the assets less any liabilities that are due at death. Each person has a mill rate band allowance, which is currently £325,000. And provided none of this has been used in the seven years before they die, there is no inheritance tax due on this part of the estate. But IHT is payable at 40% on the balance of the estate, unless any other exemptions apply. 
By way of example, gifts to spouses or civil partners who are domiciled here are entirely exempt for IHT purposes, as are gifts to UK charities. There may be other exemptions to consider as well, but it will depend on the provisions in your will as to who pays it, i.e. it may be the beneficiary of the particular gift, or you may want that gift to be free of tax, in which case the tax would be paid from the remainder of your estate if there were sufficient funds there to pay it. Thanks, Nikki. Are there any reliefs or exemptions available that clients should be aware of? The main one to be aware of is the residence nil rate band, which is essentially available in full when you leave your home to your children or remoter descendants, provided your estate is less than £2 million. This is an additional tax-free allowance currently worth £175,000. A common scenario for families with children is that the first spouse leaves everything to the other spouse, and then on the second death they leave everything to the children. In that case, there could be a million pounds of allowances available on the second death. This is because both the nil rate band and the residence nil rate band are transferable to the surviving spouse's estate, if not used on the first death, as in this example. So when the first spouse dies and everything passes to the survivor, there's a total tax exemption. So neither allowance has been used and it can be carried over to be used on the death of the second spouse. So the second estate gets the benefit of both spouses' allowances. This does assume that all the other conditions are satisfied, in particular the £2 million upper limit. This may be particularly relevant in London, where property prices have traditionally been higher than many other parts of the country. If there is any inheritance tax to pay, one advantage is that tax due on property, as opposed to cash assets, can be paid in instalments. This can be worthwhile for beneficiaries who may want to keep, say, a rental property, as they may be able to fund the instalments more easily, possibly from the rent. It's best to check with a specialist wills and probate lawyer who will be able to advise on these aspects and make sure your estate is as tax efficient as possible. Absolutely. However, I have noticed a trend of people using DIY will writing kits. Generally, I don't recommend using DIY kits or websites except for the most basic situations such as where everything is being left to a spouse or where the assets are minimal and there's no tax to pay. Getting professional help from a solicitor should be considered for most other situations and particularly where property is concerned, as for most people it's likely to be a significant part of their overall wealth and it's so easy to get it wrong. Advice from a professional ensures peace of mind and could save you and your family a lot of money in the long run. To finish things off for today, How should you decide who to trust when looking for a solicitor to deal with wills, trusts and probate matters? I'd always recommend using a solicitor to advise on these matters. Many solicitors doing this type of work are members of STEP, which means that they either have several years of experience in advising on these areas of law or have passed specialist exams. You may want to find someone who's local to you if you feel it will be helpful to have face-to-face meetings in non-pandemic times. And you may also want to find out about fees in advance to see what and how they will charge, i.e. fixed fee or hourly rates. Remember that cheapest is not always best. It's important to work with someone you trust and feel comfortable with. Family or friends may be able to recommend someone, or you may get some names from the Law Society. An initial chat with a lawyer may give you a good sense of whether this is someone you feel you can work with. All great points. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you very much, Josephine. And thank you to all of you for listening to the London Legal Podcast. We hope you found it enjoyable and useful. If you have any questions relating to anything we've discussed today, please feel free to leave a comment or get in touch with us via our website, www.hja.net. You've been listening to the London Legal Podcast, presented to you by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors.